Hi, ladies. Welcome back to World War II Part 2. Today we are going to look at um, using the atomic bomb in Japan. And first we're going to take a look at why that happened and what other choices did the, U the, did the U.S. have. And one of the things um, to keep in mind is, first of all, when this happens, we do have a different president. So FDR passes away um, in uh April of 1945, and um, that was pretty shocking for um, most Americans. If you recall the video that we watched um, back in January about FDR and how, you know, of course, how many people um, adored him and mourned um, his passing. And so this um, becomes a difficult situation for his basically newly elected vice president who becomes um, president, which is Harry Truman. And Harry Truman now inherits um, a, a pretty um, stressful um, plate of, of things that we don't know quite yet how that's going to all work. So this is kind of before um, the war officially ends although it is leaning towards going our way it is not a done deal um so truman um meets with other allied leaders and they uh basically decide and this is before um um, we actually used the bombs, but this is earlier that summer in 1945, that they all agree that they can no longer, um, or I should say only accept unconditional surrender of Japan. So at this point, when they meet, um, the war in Europe is over, and now they're still dealing with um, a war with Japan, even though the Japanese were losing. Um, there was not, it did not look like they were going to be surrendering anytime soon. So this is July of 1945. This is about a month before the war officially will end and before we use the atomic bombs on Japan. Um, in this declaration, which is a written document, it says if they, if you don't surrender Japan, you will face prompt and utter destruction. Now, what's interesting about that is that the Manhattan Project is a very top secret project, as I mentioned in the previous lecture. And that means that that was um, that our allies, especially Stalin um, and the Soviet Union, did not know what we were planning or what we had planned. And so it was important to still kind of keep that um, on the down low, so to speak. So we um, kind of kept that to ourselves. Um, for the time being. So once this declaration goes out and the Japanese receive it, they then ignore it. And so remember when I had mentioned in the previous lecture about the culture of the Japanese and not surrendering, this was something that um, was, you know, not necessarily surprising, but yet, um, you know, still, uh, still not necessarily what we were hoping for. So here are some other possibilities that the United States looked to to possibly end the war. So the first one was a mass, massive invasion of Japan. And this um, was basically after the Battle of Okinawa um, had ended, we sort of you know rallied the troops, so to speak, in, in, in putting um, a pause on um, traditional warfare because they had to strategize. So once that happened, we have to now say, okay, we're at the point where we could go into the home islands, but we have to look at the casualties of what we've already suffered and what are the projections if we continue a ground war into the home islands. So this was um, something that they did not take lightly. They called this um, Operation Downfall. So kind of think of it like equivalent to an Operation Overlord, not quite as large, of course, but um, definitely strategizing before anything would happen. This is the map of the four home islands of Japan. And so if you look at where Tokyo is on Honshu, um, this would be like the last resort kind of thing in terms of um, where um, they would go. So, you know, sort of still going like 
further north, um, if you can see the time frame at the bottom of the screen, we're looking at potentially extending the war for at least another year because this Operation Downfall would not start until November of 1945. Um, and you don't know how long that's going to last. So definitely looking at, you know, potentially having another year or so of war, which is a big expense um, psychologically, economically, um, a lot of things to take into consideration. Uh, another alternative was a naval blockade and a naval blockade to quote unquote starve Japan, meaning that we, um, um, we're, we kind of stop their ability to trade, um, and then along with just traditional bomb strikes. But we didn't feel that that was um, really a, the greatest option because we had already been bombing, even in places like Tokyo, and there was still no like response to that. So that was sort of one of the last alternatives that they would choose from. Um, a third option was to demonstrate the new weapon. So use an atomic bomb on a deserted island that would be close enough for, for Japan to see the power and the capability of the U.S. that would potentially, um, you know, force them to surrender. And then lastly, besides using the actual atomic bomb, would be a way to soften that demand of unconditional surrender. So mainly looking at, um, you know, what if we allowed them something. And that was one of the first things that um, most of the strategists that were a part of this um, decision um, kind of turned turned away from because they felt like, you know, in order to just like they dealt with the European side of the war, um, you can't give in. If we really want to stop this and stop a repeat from this happening, they have to learn their lessons from World War I. And so there has to be um, an unconditional surrender. So the final decision and the advisory group um, was basically, I would say off the top of my head, maybe like 10 people, 10 to 12 people, including Harry Truman, who's the president. Of course, he is the ultimate decision. But his advisory council consisted of people like Robert, Robert Oppenheimer, who was the head of the Manhattan Project, um, a couple of the other scientists, along with people like um, Eisenhower and other top military aides. So they couldn't recommend any other alternative because the first one in which we would have a traditional ground war invasion, so basically stick to what we've been doing, um, there were too many casualties estimated. Um, looking at the past as um, sort of projecting on the future of the way that this war was turning. Remember, they're fighting with an enemy that does things totally different than anybody they've ever fought, including the Nazis. So we're looking at, um, you know, potentially more people um, killed and especially more on the ally side than what if we use the bomb. So President Truman had the ultimate decision. And basically his reasons for using the atomic bomb were the fact that J Japan ignored the Potsdam Declaration, that he's giving them a way out. He's giving them a chance to surrender. He's giving them a chance to, um, to not put their people in any more danger. Um, he also, you know, again, this was a difficult decision for him because he's barely been president for three months when he has to make this decision. But ultimately, he believes that this bomb is a military weapon, that it is made to be used, and that it was made to actually end the war. And he knows that if it is used on Japan, there, like that will be the end of the war. There is no coming back from, um, from this type of, of weapon. Um, going back to the other alternatives, uh, I know... Many people think that, well, what about just um, using the um, or or showing the demonstration of what the bomb can do? And so, of course, that's something to consider. But um, once we get through these 
notes, you'll have a better understanding of why that probably wouldn't have worked. Because remember, we had to drop two atomic bombs, not just one. And so even after the first one was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan still did not surrender. On August 6, 1945, the Enola Gay left Tinian Island, which is an island in the Pacific, piloted by General Paul Tibbetts, who was shown in the recreation in America, the story of us. He was um, one of the best V-29 bombers, and um, he was given this mission to drop the bomb over Hiroshima. And so in the strategy of using the bombs, um, the reason why this city was um, chosen was the the U.S. had to look at a couple different things. So first of all, of course, we want to eliminate um, civilian casualties as much as possible. That, you know, it's a really horrific thing to think about when you're intentionally bombing a city filled with innocent people. However, that being said, you can't necessarily do it on like the deserted island or an open field um, to to sort of get the Japanese government's attention. So basically they had four cities chosen. Hiroshima had the and Nagasaki had the least of the populations. So this bomb um, was nicknamed Little Boy or I should say a code name, and it was dropped at 8.15 a.m. in um, Hiroshima with an estimated population of 340,000 people. So um, if you want a comparison, it would probably be like a Toledo, but a little bit smaller. So both of these cities would be like Toledo would be a good comparison. So not really a small town, not really a big city. If you include like the suburbs that surround it, um, you know, given we've got a little bit more bigger population, but it's a pretty close comparison. Before the bomb was dropped, the U.S. did fly over these cities and drop leaflets that were written in Japanese warning citizens of this upcoming attack, that this was not going to be something that was traditional and that they should leave and evacuate the city as soon as possible. And um, there were not many people that took that warning seriously. When the bomb was dropped, again, atomic bombs explode in the ground or above the ground in the air, not when they hit the ground. So it explodes at 1,600 feet above ground. Um, it was 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the center. Everything within a mile and three quarters will burn. And you can imagine what this does to the human body. Um, but basically, it um, if you were in that like city center, you, you know, you did not survive. Um, that was a... Uh, um, pretty much kind of ground zero, so to speak, for the amount of casualties that um, occurred in city center. However, when there's an atomic bomb, it's kind of resembles in a way like an earthquake where you have like, like in an earthquake, you have aftershocks and an atomic bomb or a nuclear explosion, you have shock waves. So just like when the bomb was tested in New Mexico, you had that hundred mile radius of where people could feel the impact. You could, you could feel and see and hear glass shattering. Um, so this will be like a total devastation destruction for miles and miles. And so when you see the pictures, you can see what I'm talking about. It's not just like when planes come in and bomb some areas, this is like, there was a city and now there's like nothing and it almost looks like farmland. Um, so the shock waves is where the initial attack, people who, sur who survived that initial attack may have not been um, imploded with the original um, bomb, but they may have suffered casualties like losing limbs. The biggest issue um, and, of course, serious part of using atomic weaponry that was not as well known. I mean, we obviously knew a little about radiation, but the um, effects of the radiation that Japan itself will suffer through um, for years and years and years because of these bombs and the devastation that the people that live there suffer through 
as a result of being exposed to radiation um, is, is pretty significant. And so they called it in Japan black rain because um, this is when after the um, explosion for a while, there was like this like stuff that would fall and it was actually um, sort of the remnants of the explosion and it um, would put radiation everywhere um, and definitely into the ground, um, into their water systems. And it was pretty, pretty serious um, devastation or de consequences after the bomb was, was dropped. Um, this is a picture of the Enola Gay and um, Paul Tibbetts, who was the pilot. Um, he passed away. I can't think of the year. Um, I don't have my notes in front of me, but um, maybe like 10, 15 years ago. It, it's been in the last like 20 years. And he um, has always said that he, you know, of course, the question that he would always get would be like, do you have regrets? Do you wish you wouldn't have done that? And he's like, well, first of all, like this, like this is my job, you know, like I'm a, I'm a pilot for the military and this is, I do what I'm, what I'm told to do. However, no, I don't have regrets because, you know, this saved millions of lives on the side of the allies and we're fighting a war. This is a wartime um, decision and this is something that, you know, had to be done in order to end the war um, efficiently and end the war as fast as possible. This is a picture of the two bombs that are used. So this small skinny one in the front is Little Boy and the back one in, that's bigger and um, more round in shape is called Fat Man and that's the code name for the bomb that's dropped on Nagasaki. Um, this is a picture of um, one, uh, I don't know which one it is, one of the bombs um, as it explodes from a distance um, in Japan. This is from the air, and this is Nagasaki. Um, this was taken by one of the pilots uh, as they flew away. This is um, this is uh, Hiroshima. So you can see that like there's you know there's a couple buildings standing, but it's completely decimated. That the bomb is something that wipes out can literally wipe out a city not anything like anyone has ever seen before. This is a picture that's a little disturbing, um, but these are charred remains of people in um, Hiroshima on a city street. So you would think because of what happened that the Japanese government would say, okay, we surrender, but they do not. And actually when the bomb was dropped on August 6, 1945, there was absolutely no response from the Japanese government. Um, we gave them time to surrender. And we said, if you do not surrender, we have another bomb waiting. We actually didn't have just one more bomb. We had three more bombs. And the plan was if they didn't surrender, we would keep using atomic bombs in Japan. So the next one that was planned was for Nagasaki. Um, this one will be dropped on August 6th, 1945, and the code name is Fat Man. A little bit, um, some of these population estimates kind of are, are off a little bit. Um, you know, record keeping back in the day wasn't as accurate as it is now, but it's estimated to be about an equal city, maybe a little bit smaller than um, Hiroshima. Two more bombs were waiting in the wings, and Tokyo was like a last resort. They did not want to drop a bomb like this on a city that was so heavily populated with people. It's the largest city in Japan. Um, the next bomb potentially would have been dropped on Kyoto, either on August 17th or 18th, and then go from there with Tokyo being the last resort. What's um, interesting about um, looking at the casualty numbers coming out of Japan, there's really not an accurate um, estimate. Again, like if you don't have an accurate estimation of the population prior to an attack of this sort, you're not going to have like the casualties, the number of casualties to be accurate. So it's estimated 
that there were anywhere from 90 to 150,000 casualties in Hiroshima. And remember, casualties are both people that are killed and also people that are wounded or injured. Um, and then Nagasaki was 70,000 to 100,000. But, you know, these, I mean, this is catastrophic. You know, we're looking at obviously some really large numbers of people that suffered during um, these attacks. The effects of radiation and sickness will plague these areas for years to come. Um, cancer rates in people that live in these areas of Japan skyrocket um, into the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Um, birth rates decline, birth defects increase. There's a lot of significant um, lingering issues with radiation and sickness for a very long time. These are some photos of, um, unfortunately, some of the casualties that people suffer after both of the bombings. This picture is to show um, 1945 in um, this is actually from 2007, but a, f a more modern day photo of what the city looks like now. Um, it, obviously, it was rebuilt and they have um, a memorial there in um, Hiroshima that um, memorializes the day that it was a that they were attacked and the people that died. What's really interesting about um, this whole event was that for years um and part of it is just the fact that it's war because one of the questions i if you guys were in front of me i'm sure some of you are asking like well how can japan and the united states be such great allies now or how did that you know ever happen like in terms of forgiveness or um like putting stuff in the past and i would say that number one it's war so we have to remember that it's a totally different time the japanese um, government and were not innocent by any means. If you ever have a chance in college, if you're interested in history and if you take um, a class about the history of China or Japanese Chinese relations, like the stuff that that they did and they um, did to the Chinese people, especially in the late 20s and early 30s, is really horrendous. Um, the Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor. Um, they killed many Americans, and um, we retaliate back with atomic bombs. And so I know that it's in a different level. But what's interesting is that for the about uh, 70 years or so, both countries um, never really acknowledged formally any type of like an apology, nor would any head of state visit either place. So the very first time this happens, um, I believe was on the 70, 70th or 75th anniversary of the attack of Pearl Harbor when um, the Prime Minister of Japan and his wife made a visit to Honolulu and went to Pearl Harbor um, and apologized on the behalf of um, the Japanese nation. This was back in, in um, uh, a few years ago. So it was pretty modern times when President Obama was in the White House and President Obama was the very first head of state from the U.S. to visit both um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, and do the same. Um, but it was a little bit different because both countries agreed that we can't necessarily like apologize, first of all, for things that happened way before any of us were born. But second of all, in an act of war, it's very different than if it was um, like a, a different, um, I know like morality wise, it sounds weird, but you know, it's a little bit different than if it was like during a peacetime. And so, so President Obama on behalf of the United States doesn't necessarily apologize because he's like, this was a wartime military decision. We cannot necessarily apologize or take back what we did, nor would we have changed those actions because, you know, it secured democracy for, for us and for countries around, around the world. And Japan will totally change into this modern day democracy that it is. Um, after World War II. So the apology is a little bit, you know, maybe like about people dying, but not necessarily about what happened. Um, and sometimes it's hard for us to understand in modern day what was at stake back in the 1940s and thinking about, well, maybe if I was president, I would have done something else. Um, 
one of the things we would have done in class if we were together would actually um, be a simulation of having like an advisory council to um, uh, President Truman and each group would have to come up with their own way to end the war. And so it's always interesting to me how many um, students will always choose atomic bombs versus how many that choose um, other alternate way ways. And maybe that's just because we know what the outcome was. But regardless, um, we declare victory in Japan on August 14th, 1945. It's also known as VJ Day. So we have VE Day, which is victory in Europe. But for the U.S., this is actually more significant because um, the fact that Jap the Japanese had attacked us at Pearl Harbor, all of these feelings that Americans had um, for those few years um, about being victorious and and beating Japan and you know all of those things because we had a war on two fronts. So even though it was great that it ended in Europe we still were fighting in the Pacific. And so this was um, something that was celebrated. The picture that you see on the screen of the sailor kissing um, the nurse, that's a very um, famous picture. Um, there's actually a huge statue in San Diego that encapsulates this moment. But there were parades, there was celebration, um, there was a lot of happiness, um, that the war was finally over and it really felt like this time that a war like this would never happen again. Um, the formal surrender was signed on September 2nd. Um, this was in Tokyo Bay on the U.S. Missouri, USS Missouri. You actually see the footage from this at the end of the episode of World War II Endgame. So if you've already watched the video, you would have, have seen this. But um, this was extremely significant for the Japanese government. Um, and, you know, moving forward, we'll talk about kind of that wrapping up in the next time uh, about the end of the war and, and what that um, sets up for the future. But for the most part at this point, the American people were just happy that that war was over. So this is a still shot from... Um, that document being signed. Okay, so that concludes our PowerPoint and lecture on the war in the Pacific um, and the atomic bombs being used. So again, I invite you to ask any questions, send me an email, um, pop on classroom, put something in the class comments. I'd be happy to answer any questions um, about what you just saw or if you need to go over anything with me, um, you can reach me. Through email, we can set up a FaceTime if um, you would like to do that. I'd be happy to do that with you. So we're almost done. We have one more PowerPoint and lecture. So I will see you next time.